I was sure looking forward to an in-person meeting here, but uh, it's good to see everybody like this too. Amen. Bob, are you wearing a tie? My Christmas tie. <laughs> oh, see, we can't see it. You need, yeah, oh, that's adorable. <laughs> Uh-oh, I just we're, got... We're streaming now, and I'm just going to put the slate up here for a minute and take it down, and then we'll begin here in a minute or two. Merry Christmas. You still have me, Chris? I do. Okay. I don't see, uh, how come I, see, I don't see my uh, view at all. I'll take the uh, slide down and we'll be able to take a look at who's in the meeting right now. I see everybody, but I don't see myself. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Bill. <laughs> hey, Richard. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Welcome for audio. There you go. No, not quite. We're not here. Um, I think maybe because you joined on the the attendee login as perhaps maybe not the Zoom invite that I sent to you. Uh, oh. That's why your camera may not be enabled. We certainly can hear you though. Alrighty. Okay. So I think uh, if you, if you can uh, if you're good with this, I'm good. We'll stay with this then. Okay. I didn't know I did that when I connected. Karen, like your background. Thanks. Which Karen? Oh, that's oh, nice. Oh, Karen Mullins. We can't see you, Karen. I didn't even know you were there. I just got here. Oh, there you are. Hi. Hey, Monica. Oh, All Karen. right, Mr. Chairman. It is uh, 1.30, so I think if Jennifer is ready to go, uh, we can proceed. I'm ready. Very good. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. It is 1.30. Uh, Welcome to this December meeting of the uh, Citizens Advisory Committee for t -BARTA. We'll call the meeting to order and if Jennifer will do a roll call, we'll know who's in attendance, please. Okay. Bob Henyon. Here. Bill Roberts. Here. Bob Widmer. Uh, here. Lynn Gruber-White. Here. Josh Frank. Here. Richard Bedford. Richard Balcom. Here. Travis Norton. Leonardo DeSorts. Bill Johnson. David Goodwin. I'm here. Rick Richmond. Rob Serku, Karen Mullins. Here. And I see Karen Schwartz as well. And then last but not least, Sarah Calhoun. Here. Perfect. Uh, uh, Jennifer, uh, uh, Bill Johnson, I think just uh, logged in if you want to call the roll for him. Bill Johnson, are you there? I am here and there's snow in the window outside. Oh my goodness. I guess you're not in Florida. <laughs> All right. Well, we can get started. We, um, I do have to let everybody know we are not going to be able to approve the minutes because we cannot approve anything electronically, even though we do have a quorum because we would have to meet in person according to the governor's um, rules being back in play. So what we'll do is we'll go ahead and forward the minutes from October to our meeting in February. Okay, that'll, that'll be fine. Does anybody have any corrections that they want to make to the minutes while we're in this meeting? If not, we'll bring them back up at the next meeting. Okay, hearing none, we'll proceed that way. Uh, Jennifer, I think Rick Richmond also joined the meeting after you called his name. Did you record him as present? Rick, are you there? I do see you. Okay. Okay. Great. Right. I've noted he's in yeah. attendance. Thank you. All right, very difficult. good. I can hear you great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
Before we get into our presentations, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Ken Bowden, the new Director of Commuter Services for TBARTA. Ken, welcome aboard. Welcome to the CAC meeting and uh, take, take a moment to uh, tell us a little, about, a little bit about yourself and what you envision. Thank you. Um, can everybody hear me okay? We can. Yeah. Great. Okay. Well, I, I apparently joined uh, the wrong link, wrong link, so I don't have a video <laughs> feed on this, and I do apologize for that. Um, yeah, I've been doing uh, TDM outreach in the Denver metro area for the last uh, nine years, um, and just recently moved down to Tampa. I am thrilled to be here. Um, and uh, really what we wanna do is continue to build the commuter services uh, programs with TBARTA, with Commute Tampa Bay. And um, we'll be reaching out to uh, all of you folks uh, for your assistance and advice um, and uh, all the TMOs and our uh, many partners throughout the region. Um, I'm excited to be here and I look forward to uh, making the program uh, strong and uh, keeping it running smoothly. Thank you. Well, good. Ken, thanks uh, for your comments. Welcome aboard again. Uh, I uh, hope you'll join all of our CAC meetings. I think you'll find this an engaged group and commuter uh, services is one of our one of our high priorities. So it's a, I mean, yeah, it's a pleasure to do so. I'll, I'll join uh, on a regular basis. Good. All right. Um, the next item on our agenda is the first of the presentations. Is Ron Pierce on the line to give that? I am. Yes, I am, Mr. Chairman. Oh, good afternoon, Ron. Welcome. We're looking forward to hearing from you. Go ahead. Hey, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, um, committee members, I'm Ron Pierce, President and CEO of RSA Consulting Group. Um, we have the pleasure of being the lobbying team um, for T Barta. And I think what um, Bill has asked us to kind of give you an overview of what our agenda looks like for the upcoming session. Before we do that, I thought it may be helpful for you for me to kind of set the landscape of Tallahassee for you really quick. So just really, really quick. Um, so, you know, as the election's over, congratulations to everybody for surviving another election cycle. Um, you know, Republicans in Florida had a really, really good night on election day. And um, in the Florida House, Republicans gained five seats. Um, I will tell you, not many people saw that coming, including um, current House leadership. I would tell you that I think they were surprised as anybody to be able to pick up five seats. There was a number of seats that were very competitive seats that I think at the end of the day, um, they would have been probably happy with coming back at 70, you know, 73, 47, but they um, not only held all of the very competitive seats, but ended up picking up five seats, picked up a seat in St. Petersburg and Jennifer Webb picked up a Sarasota seat, one over in Port St. Lucie and two down in, um, down in Miami-Dade County. And then in the Florida Senate, the Republicans picked up a seat as well, which again, um, going into election night, it was 23-17 Republican majority. Most people kind of felt it would be 22-18 after the election, um, ended up being 24-16 majority. So um, Senator, Senator Wilton Simpson from Pasco County is the new Senate president. Um, Chris Browns from Pinellas County is the, the new speaker of the Florida House. That's great for T-Barta having two presiding officers in our backyard, which is fantastic. Yep. Um, election cycles always create uh, new opportunities with new members in the Florida Senate. Out of the 40 members of the Florida Senate, two of them, excuse me, 10 of them are now new. Many of them came over from, from the Florida House, but 10 are new senators. There are 41, yes, 41 new House members out of 120 uh, members of the Florida House, there's 41 of them that are um, that are new. Probably the most pressing issue for the House and Senate, both from a priority standpoint, ladies and gentlemen, is going to be the budget. If you look at what COVID's done to the budget in the short term, if you really look at the, the way they do budgets right now, it's kind of a three-year cycle in Tallahassee, three-year outlook. If you look at just the, the next two years, um, if you look at 21, 22, and 22, 23, um, the budget shortfall the legislature is currently looking at is about $5 billion on paper. Um, of the $5 billion, there are some reserves they can tap, can tap into. There's some CARE Act dollars that are still sitting in Tallahassee that the governor and the legislature will need to expend at some point. Um, that totals, by the way, about $6 billion. They don't want to spend all of that in the short term. So 
they will be able to backfill some of the um, some of those losses in revenue potentially um, by backfilling with CARES Act dollars as well as um, some reserves as well. In addition to that, we don't know what the federal government's going to do yet. Um, it looks like they're getting close to passing another stimulus package out of DC. This stimulus package will not, it looks like, include any type of um, funding for local and state governments. We would expect potentially um, another probably stimulus package sometime during um, President-elect President Biden's first 100 days, so kind of keep on the lookout on that. That obviously could have a huge impact on Florida as well, um, just because of our population, you know, and I'm talking, by the way, just about the, the revenue side, I'm talking about expenses. If you look at expenses, for example, Medicaid alone, by the way, is gonna go up by $2 billion, $2 billion in the state. Um, and that's a lot for the, you know, the federal government will cover the majority of that through June 30th, to July 1st, <laughs> have to make some decisions how you, how you pay for that. So um, I mentioned, there's a bunch of things we'll be working on. Back in the case, will be front and center with the house. Um, you know, COVID liability, business liability will be, be important for the House and Senate. On the Senate side, let me just mention one, the seminal gaming compact right now is not as is not being enforced in the state of Florida. I'm not going to the reasons why, but um, you know, that's about $300 million in revenue they're leaving on the table. The Florida Senate, I think, wants to do a new, new seminal compact with the Seminole Indian tribe that would include um, additional gaming. It would include roulette craps and live sports embedding. That would total about almost a billion dollars in new revenue. So you talk about $5 billion shortfall for the next couple of years, that very quickly could be filled up with a billion dollars in new revenue just by the by the compact, um, compact itself. Let me shift to Team Artem. Um, so we have two major asks um, in Tallahassee coming up. First and foremost um, is uh, recurring funding of $1.5 million for operations. Um, the last couple of years, um, two years ago, we were able to get $2.5 million out of Tallahassee and non-recurring transportation trust fund dollars um, out of DOT. $1.5 million was for operations, a million of that. But in addition to that, another million on top of that was for um, innovative and, um, uh, you know, kind of new technologies as it relates to transit as well to kind of study some of those opportunities. Um, t Bart has been spending the million dollars, as you've all seen. They're, they're right now they're looking at um, aerial, you know, um, the gondola concept. They're looking at air taxis. They also looked at um, Hyperloop as well. Um, you know, there's I think there's some other ones they're going to look at at some point to to expend those dollars. Our ask um, is going to continue to be the 1.5 million for operations, but our ask is going to be is we, we need to come up with some type of recurring funding at some point. We cannot continue to go back to Tallahassee every year and ask for non-recurring revenue because at some point, like last year, for example, our money got vetoed out of Tallahassee. We had 1.5 million in the budget. The governor vetoed it. Governor veto vetoed it for a number of reasons. First and foremost was we received CARE Act dollars last year. They were very familiar with any, any organization that received CARE Act dollars doesn't need to receive in their, their mind state dollars on top of it. So um, so they, they ended up vetoing the 1.5 million last year. What's important to you all um, as a committee is this, the 1.5 million typically comes out of the transportation trust fund. Here's the problem with the way that works is, the way the, way the Department of Transportation um, looks at non-recurring um, trust fund dollars is, it's not in addition to, so the 1.5 million is not on top of the current plan. What happens is they'll go find $1.5 million in other transit projects from the region, take the money out of those projects and give it to us. So it's happening, um, not because we want it to, but inadvertently when the legislature makes these decisions of giving us non-recurring transportation trust fund dollars is, it impacts hard and it, it impacts PSTA and other transit agencies throughout the region. And so um, what our idea this year is that what we're pursuing is we're instead of giving transportation trust fund dollars through DOT is getting non-recurring revenue line items specifically to come to TVARTA, which we're able to do. TVARTA is a special district created by the legislature because of that, we can get a direct appropriation. And so our ask of House and Senate leadership will continue to be 1.5 million in non-recurring general revenue. Um, we would love to get recurring you know, revenue and that's really our ass is recurring, but knowing that you're, you're facing a $5 billion shortfall, most likely in the, in the short term, 
it's going to be, um, it's most likely to be non-recurring revenue, but we'll ask for recurring and see kind of where we end up at. In addition to that, we're also going to run a, a piece of legislation for our enabling act. And there's really three things that we want to kind of do in that. Number one is, so on the full board right now, one of the issues we have is we have the two mayors, the mayor of St. Petersburg and the mayor of Tampa are on the board. The mayor of St. Petersburg and the mayor of Tampa are very busy. So for them to be able to show up at a monthly meeting um, is, pr is problematic for their schedules. And so one of the things we're going to try to do is allow the mayor of the city of Tampa, St. Petersburg to appoint a designee, has to be a designee of their city council, preferably the same person would show up if we're not able to do it, but they would have the full voting rights in the position of the, of the mayor. That would help from a quorum standpoint, because that way if the mayors can't attend, we know that their designees would be there. And again, to ensure that we can get to a quorum, um, especially when we have to go back to in-person meetings, which are starting now. The other issue is, and um, this is getting a little in the weeds, but I'll share it with you is, the right now, the way our definition of a quorum is in our enabling act is a little weird. Um, there's some there's some conflict on really what is a quorum, but more importantly is what's a quorum for a passing vote? That's the bigger issue. So we worked with committee staff, staff last year to kind of come up with the standard definition of what a quorum would be um, in statute with other agencies. We remove all the mandated committees um, out of the list of committees um, for TBARTA. There is no reason, by the way, that any of the committees should be in Florida statute, by the way. Um, it really ties the hand of the board of what committees would look like moving forward. So if you ever wanted to create a new committee, you'd have to go back and basically change law to be able to do that. Um, that goes all the way back to 20, you know, whenever it was created, 2010, 2011, when Tiabardo was originally created. So that's just kind of, that's just kind of clean up. And then the last thing is, is removing the chair's coordinating council from Tiabardo. Um, three years ago, I believed we took the um, CCC, put it under TBAR. We thought it'd make a lot of sense to do that. Um, I think the chair's coordinating council, as well as TBAR, have kind of realized it's just not a good fit. It really should be back over with the MPOs. And so I think we're going to put the chair's coordinating council back over the MPO. And again, everybody's kind of signed off on that. Last issue is, and this is not in the bill right now, but it's an issue that um, it's kind of real world because we're dealing with it um, in this meeting is is allowing um, TBAR to have the ability to um, do virtual meetings to get a quorum. Um, we've introduced that concept in the past in Tallahassee and it, we've had some pushback on it. Um, I think that the way you could structure it where you have to have the majority of the, the members of the board in person to be able to, to have a quorum. And maybe you can only have one person virtually to kind of get to the quorum where they can conduct business. When you're a regional um, board with five counties, especially when our, when our meetings move around, um, you know, I'm sure, you know, Jennifer um, and, and Chris will tell you as staff members, when we move our meetings from T, from T Barta and we go to like Manatee County or we go up to Hernando County, chances of us getting a quorum fall off the table. Um, it's just, you know, it's a lot of travel and also we're asking members to travel an hour and a half there and an hour and a half from spend two hours of meeting most of your day spent in the T-Bar at a board meeting. So one of the things we're gonna to try to work with staff in Tallahassee on are um, what is it, you know, what is our, um, uh, if we can do a quorum, but do a quorum in such a way that only a limited number of board members could actually be on the phone or in the Zoom um, setting to be able to do that. We don't have our bill sponsors lined up. You're gonna ask me, so who are our bill sponsors? We're in the process of finalizing that. Um, Amber Mariano from Pasco County, I believe is gonna be our house bill sponsor. I'm, I'm hoping to finalize that um, pretty quick. The reason I haven't finalized it yet, she's got a good reason on being tardy on an answer is she's getting married on Saturday. Um, so um, we're gonna let her get her to the wedding when she gets back to the first year, but I'm pretty sure she's gonna do it. And on the Senate side, um, we're gonna, um, we're in the process of talking to a couple of senators um, Jim Boyd is going to be one. We've talked to, we're going to, you know, Jeff Brandis has been supportive in the past, talked to Senator Brandis and as well as Danny Burgess. So those are a, a couple we're looking at. So um, I'll stop there. Uh, I'm sure you all have questions, comments about our agenda, but anything else relating to what's happening in Tallahassee and Mr. Chairman, I'd be more than glad to answer any questions um, the committee may have. Thank you, Thank you Ron. That, that's a great update. You covered a lot of ground. Uh, are there questions from Committee members, uh, raise your hand visually or in the or otherwise. Karen Mullins has her hand raised. Okay, Karen. Hey, 
am so happy that things are moving forward in the legislature and looking good for the Tampa Bay area. Are we looking at a hard hit from COVID? We've waited years and years for this trifecta to hit our area where we're moving forward. And all our, cons all our consulting um, people said this was gonna be the year Tabarda shined and was gonna get, gonna get our money. And now I'm hearing that we might not be in that position. Is that correct? Uh, Karen, I think we'll get dollars out of Tallahassee. And it's not sure if it'd be recurring versus non-recurring. We're going to continue to ask for some type of recurring money, but I feel confident we can get something in the short term. Because what we really need to get to is we need a project that's going to pay for. And the BRT project is probably that project where you start getting some dollars that the agency then could survive and live off of those and operate off, off of those you know, that revenue. Um, we, we obviously need to kind of get to the point where BRT becomes a reality. Um, you know, it, I think we'll get dollars out of Tallahassee. I think the question and our, I think what we're gonna have to fight for is where do those dollars come from? Is it recurring? Is it non-recurring? Is it DOT trust fund dollars? Is it a mix of all of the above? Um, I think Senator Simpson, um, you know, President Simpson now, and Speaker Sprouls, I think are committed to trying to be helpful. And I do really believe they will commit to being helpful at the end of the day. Okay, because I know Sprouls is termed out. I mean, I'm not saying he won't run for Senate or some, you know, something else, but we've only got two years on this. We don't have the span of, of the Senate. So this was supposed to be the year that we hit the ground running, and I'm not hearing that. No, we'll hit the ground running. Our, our funding, I mean, our, our opportunity for this year, we're hoping to get, I think that when the stars align for this year, we we're hoping to get recurring money care. And that was really, I think, the goal. Um, when you're facing a $5 billion, $5 billion shortfall, I think getting recurring money could be a challenge. So um, now remember, we do have a two-year window. I mean, I don't think the $5 billion shortfall will be as big as everybody thinks it's going to be. I think it's going to be closer to $4 billion. If you look at the revenue estimates that they put out back in June, um, we've been over every estimate the that they originally, the, new rep the um, revenue estimate in conference put out. So um, those are very, very conservative numbers. We've been above all those numbers. But Karen, you bring up a really good point about the stars aligning is um, the DOT work plan is another good example of that. DOT work plan is being impacted in a big way. And so like the West Shore Interchange was supposed to be in the work plan in 2024, it just moved back to 2026. Um, I think the stars will align there, Karen, to get it back to 24. But it's going to take, you know, it's going to take Wilton Simpson and Chris Browns to be able to do that. And again, I think they understand the importance of that because, and for all the committee, why that's important is, is if the, if 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 the West Shore Interchange is put out to 2026, even though it's only two years, that means the replacement of the Howard Franklin Bridge would be done in almost two years in advance of the West Shore Interchange being completed which means you're gonna have pretty six lanes coming off the bridge back into three lanes on you know, the interchange. And so that's a really, really big deal. So that's something that um, you're gonna see a number of business organizations kind of rally around um, to make sure that we can get the West Shore Interchange back into 24, which would is important not only to the Howard Franklin Bridge, but also to the BRT projects as well. Bill, I've got a follow-up. Can I go again? Please, go All ahead. Right. Um, I'm hearing you say that they're discussing um, renegotiating the Seminole Tribe PAC. Um, the Seminole Tribe is not doing all that well with their casinos right now. Is that a concern? Um, I think and that's for them to decide. I think what the Florida legislature is looking at is right now they're not collecting $300 million uh, right. for the last year and a half. Um, because it's similar, you know, the, the combat was null and void. Again, I won't bore you with the details, but why, the, why, it's, not, why it's not in effect right now. But um, really the crown jewel of that is, I think the Seminoles want this is, they want live sports betting. Live sports betting, I think, would help increase revenues there. And so um, three or two, two plus years ago, the United States Supreme Court ruled that, um, you know, you can, the federal government cannot prohibit live sports betting from, um, from the states. Right. So because of that, and I think you've seen, don't quote me on this, 11, 12, 13 states that have now put live sports betting um, into, um, into effect. And I think Florida is a big, a, a big market for that potentially. And so I think that's what, you know, the Seminoles aren't probably collecting as much as they have been collecting, obviously due to COVID. Yeah. Um, but if you start adding roulette, craps, and live sports, you know, betting to that as well, 
And plus, you know, with we don't the, by the end of 21, hopefully as, you know, everything starts to open back up. This is really a long-term play for them, not a short-term play. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank, thank you, Karen. Any other questions from the committee? Ron, I have one one quick question for you, and that is as to strategy. Um, have you thought about proposing a bill that had uh, non-recurring revenue for maybe one or two years, but then locked in a recurring source of revenue from the Department of Transportation or some other source that kicked in two years down the road? Yeah, and, and Bill, we've thought about that. The challenge is um, you can't you can't tie the hands of future legislatures um, within a bill. We can try to get a commitment out of DOT to you know, to put funds in through, um, I'll make up a thing, like the Rail Enterprise Fund, for example, um, as an opportunity there. Um, we have talked to DOT about some long-term funding strategies, but um, unfortunately that would encompass probably a bill, but I think it would encompass is, how do, we, how do we get through the next two to three years from an operating standpoint to be able to get to BRT? And DOT has been actually working with us. They're the one that can actually, we sat down with them and you know, for full disclosure, they're the one that said you should really just look at it, look at a direct line item directly to T Barta versus going through DOT. That makes it cleaner, easier, and it takes us out of the middle, and it takes it takes the trust fund out of play, which we really, really want to do. We don't want to harm harm our transit our transit partners. So, yeah. so but we're looking at that. It probably wouldn't be a bill to do that, but I think it would be um, looking at additional pots of money that are out there. For example, CIS funding. Um, you know, there's some top opportunity about making that more flexible in the future. Maybe there's some ways we can try to, you know, tap into some additional pots of money that are currently out there today that the legislature can make it easier for us to do that. That's something that we'll be very proactive on. Okay. Thanks, Ron. And I, I think I can speak for this committee if we can be of any assistance in uh, speaking with our local elected officials. Uh, all of the members of this committee are probably happy to do that. Any other questions of Ron? Josh Frank raised think. his hand and so has Karen. Pardon me? Uh, Josh Frank and Karen oh, have each raised Josh, hands. Go ahead. You recognize Josh. Thank you, Chair. Um, Ron, just a quick question. You said that a lot of the potential funding for TBARDA comes from or is tied to, in a lot of ways, uh, project based funding. Um, and so obviously the big one is the BRT project. Um, and you mentioned that. But um, how, I guess, uh, how frequent do those come up in terms of, are there other projects that we have uh, on the list of things we've wanted to do as a board that you know, may be able to um, be packaged together to sort of cobble away through the next couple of years or does that seem less likely um, given, the, given the climate? Yeah, Josh, that's a great question. And so I think that's really why I think the legislature gave t a, a year and a half, two years ago, that million dollars to kind of look at innovative and new technologies as it relates to transit. Because I think the hope was number one for us to kind of be a clearinghouse. They, you know, Tallahassee doesn't want to be a referee on what to think, what new technologies get or does not get funding. Number one, and number two is it made a lot of sense. Is if you can come up with new technology from a transit standpoint that could be more regional in nature, what would that look like? As the study, the more importantly, if, if it's an, a, pi a pilot opportunity or something else, it could create some funding opportunities for T-BARTA down the line. In the short term, I don't see any of those in the short term just because they're not in a work plan anywhere. They're not, the MPO's not discussing them. Those are kind of yet to be done. Um, you know, so I think there may be some opportunities. And we actually just met with, um, t Barta met with a couple of house members recently. And they, they've asked us, by the way, are we open to getting additional dollars to look at additional, you know, transit opportunities in the future as it relates to technology? And the answer is absolutely. Um, you know, if we have the opportunity to do that because it does create an opportunity for, yes, we're doing a study on top of that, but we do, you can use a portion of that from an administrative standpoint as well. So, um, so there may be an opportunity um, if there are, you know, autonomous vehicles, a great example of that, right? If somebody has an autonomous you know, vehicle um, pilot project or something that we could be helpful on, I think we'd be proactive on, you know, with that opportunity in Tallahassee. Other hands raised? Thanks, Ron. Karen? Karen yeah. Mullis, yeah. yeah. Thank you. I had a, a follow-up question to the West Shore Interchange. Since that money has been diverted to other projects around the state, is how is that going to impact our BRT? 
Well, right now, if you look at the way the DOT work plans worked out, it would push back some of the BRT stuff by upwards of two years. Remember, they're only having to do that right now because in those, Karen, you said those dollars are going to other projects. They're really not even going to other projects. What's happening right now is they're looking at the work plan and going, okay, we don't, we're gonna be short X billions of dollars. Um, that has to come off right now, the spreadsheet. We need to push those out. What does that look like? That's why they pushed it back. That's why West Shore Interchange was an easy work for them to push back is because the price tag alone, right? I mean, it was easy to say, okay, well, let's just push that back two years instead of impacting eight other projects or five other projects. So um, what DOT and others will tell you is um, nothing's done, nothing's finalized until the Florida legislature, legislature passes the DOT work plan as a part of their budget. And I, I think a lot of the folks at DOT and others would also tell you that they believe that once they fund the work plan, there will be other DOT, DOT dollars available. In other words, the trust fund's gonna come back in a bigger way over the next few months than they originally anticipated. And at that point, the legislature can do one of two things. Number one, they could sweep the trust fund and put it in general revenue to fill some of the GR stuff. Um, all of you should think that's a terrible idea because if they do that, they can't go back and restore portions of the um, portions of the DOT work plan. So our hope is what will happen is with um, having, especially the two presiding officers from Tampa Bay, our ask of them would be is, as we get further in the budget, budget process and it looks like the trust fund may be coming back better than we originally hoped, let's move at least at a minimum the West Shore, the West Shore interchange back to 24. Because there was other portions they moved as well. There's a, there's a 275 project in Pinellas that impacts us, it's been moved. But the West Shore interchange is the first domino. You make that domino fall, I think the other ones will come back into alignment. Okay, thanks, Ron. Other hands up? Any other questions? I don't see any. Okay, thank you, Chris. Ron, okay. thanks a lot for taking the time to bring us up to speed and uh, keep us posted anytime you think we can be helpful. Absolutely. And Bill, if you want, you know, I know you guys meet um, on a pretty regular basis. Um, if you want me to come back and maybe give an update during session, as you know, there'll be two committee weeks in February, three in March, or excuse me, two in January, three in February. Session starts March the 2nd, ends April the 30th. If you want us to come back and give a presentation during March or April, if you have a meeting then, I'm happy to give you an update of kind of what's happening from Tallahassee. Great, Ron. We'll certainly invite you back probably for our April meeting. Appreciate okay, the good. Thanks, everybody. Happy holidays. You too, Ron. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have a point yes. of order here. Small point of order. I, th I think we uh, should ask for public comment. Uh, I know uh, Keisha Lindo has been watching for that, and I'm not sure if we called for that at the beginning of the meeting. No, I, I appreciate it. I realized that during Ron's presentation. Uh, Keisha, is there any, uh, any public comment? Anybody signed up? Hi, Bill. We have no public comments at this time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, for checking up on us there. Uh, our second presentation is the uh, Downtown St. Petersburg Mobility Study. Um, Be sure Sarah, are you, Sarah, are you ready? Yes, thank you. All right, you're Good on. Afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarah Caper with Forward Pinellas. I'm managing the Downtown St. Petersburg Mobility Study, which is a joint effort with the City of St. Petersburg and the Florida Department of Transportation. We're all funding partners, and then we're also working very closely with Pinellas County and PSTA as part of a management team. Next slide. Here's a little bit about this study for those of you who aren't familiar with it. It's a pretty co um, pretty general study to define first a vision for multimodal mobility in the greater downtown St. Petersburg area. And you can see the map on the slide has a modeling area with a dashed line. That's the area we're looking at the impact of different types of improvements. And then we have some focus corridors and a focus project area in more of the heart of downtown. We're going to be testing improvement strategies against different performance measures. Those performance measures will be related to livability, 
mobility, economic vitality, and we're going to be looking for public input to help us figure out what those performance measures are and what success looks like. And ultimately, we're going to develop a set of projects and programs to advance and some kind of action plan. The study includes multiple phases, and for each of these phases, we also have an outreach component or multiple outreach components. We started this study this summer. It took us a little while to get going, and we've been working on a context assessment, looking at what's been done before, what kind of studies have been out there, what does it look like today? And we're in the part where we're concluding that assessment, but also at the same time thinking about what is our vision for mobility, those performance measures and projects, Ultimately, we're going to have different scenarios and evaluation of those projects against the performance measures and come up with that project priority list and action plan. Earlier this summer, we conducted some outreach and some surveys. We are just now doing another phase of outreach and we'll continue to reach out to the public throughout the study. So to start, we wanted to think about what is our vision and what does the mobility future look like for downtown St. Pete? What goals should we have? And on the slide, you can see some of the ones that we've thought of, which is having a safe, accessible, multimodal, connected and vibrant downtown. But we recognize that everybody has a different vision for what they think downtown should look like. At the same time, we're also thinking about, well, how do we get there? What does success look like? And this relates to those performance measures that I mentioned earlier. So how do we know what our vision looks like? When are we successful and what do we value? So for example, we're looking at things related to crashes, how we reduce them, especially the most severe. What does business access look like? How is important uh, is it to have parking, to have bicycle and pedestrian facilities all near your businesses? The mode share, so how are people getting to downtown? How are they traveling once they're there? What do we think that should look like and what is it today? And then also travel time. We know, especially for the hospitals, travel time is very important as well as the major employers. And these are just examples of some of the things we're looking at. We'll be looking at more as well. And we'll be using those to help us inform what type of projects we should be evaluating. And then how do we balance different competing needs? We know there are trade-offs that we all have to make when it comes to balancing different modes and users. So how do we value these different things and where is there some give and take? Some examples for you are quick and easy vehicle access, safe bicycle and pedestrian connections or conditions, and also how connected is the community? There are a lot of neighborhoods around the downtown and how important is it that they're connected? And I'll go through some of our initial findings for you. As I mentioned, we did a survey this summer and we we're really interested in learning a little bit more about how people travel and why they go downtown. So you can see here and all of the results are also available online on the Forward Pinellas website that a lot of people are going to visit museums or for events. We did get a number of people who live in the downtown area and people who shop there. We also asked about how people travel. So many people get to downtown with their personal vehicle and people could select more than one option. So these won't necessarily add up to 100. But almost half the people who did the survey said at some point they used a car personal vehicle to get there. But then if you look at how people travel once they get there, it's predominantly walking. So it's interesting to see what kind of patterns and trends of how people move once they're in the downtown area. We also asked about the primary transportation issue, which you can see here in the word cloud, things that might be, be something you expect, biking, parking, transit, safety, traffic are all very important things. We also wanted to hear from people about communication, as you've probably all experienced in the time of COVID, how we communicate with people is very different. And so we wanted to understand from the survey participants the best ways that they thought to provide information to them and then also to get their feedback. Overwhelmingly, we heard that surveys were the, the best way, but as it was a survey, we know there's a, a little bit of a um, bias that might be inherited in there. So we're always looking at different ways or more ways that we can reach out to people. Next. 
So one of the other pieces we've been working on is a review of existing plans. Uh, there's a lot of area and neighborhood plans, over 25 of them that we reviewed so far, and we were looking for common themes. So some of them that we heard, the importance of bicycle and pedestrian access and enhancements, having multimodal roadways, the importance of the waterfront, transit, especially access to the Sun Runner, and then obviously the Tropicana field site redevelopment is a very important consideration for us in this study, and especially as it relates to better access for the communities to the south of downtown. Here's a little bit of a look at some of the socioeconomic conditions. We started to look at what different transportation models and different um, surveys and other census data has for us. So we looked at where the people today are living and working by acre. And you can see what you might expect of concentrations in and around the downtown core. We also looked at a range of different communities and community plans and efforts. You can see on the slide some of the ones we've looked at and who we've been including in some of our stakeholder communications. We've been working on looking at different health indicators and the American Community Survey and other uh, ways to understand the demographics and socioeconomic data of the area. So looking at, for example, how many people are using transit, walking or biking for their commute. And we found that 16 to 29 percent of households in this area have no car, which is very important for our non-auto modes. The health indicators looking to see um, where the health percentages are in line with other health assessments that have been conducted. Also looking at the median household income and then the poverty level and where people are living at 100% below the poverty level. We've also been working on an analysis of the existing facilities based on plans, looking at crash data, the sidewalk network. So you can see on this map, I know it's a little hard to read, but we try to point out some of the areas of where we might be able to focus on where there's inconsistent sidewalk coverage. We've also heard a lot about the interstate spurs being barriers for the neighborhoods and their ability to connect into downtown, looking at where this sidewalk is uh, maybe not in the best of shape, and also where our most severe crashes are. We really are focusing, like our Safe Streets Pinellas effort, on where the worst of our crashes are, those that are fatal or incapacitating, so that we could prevent them and see if there are any trends of safety improvements we should be making. We did a similar look at bicycle facilities and bicycle crashes. And we found so far that there are very limited east-west dedicated facilities. There's a lot more available in north-south, though that does depend on the area that you're in. There are only two protected bike lanes in the core of the downtown area. And then if you look at the crashes, you can see where um, with that red shading, some of our worst crashes are, our most concentrated crashes. Next, oh, thank you. And then we did a similar look at the transit service. We know with the Sun Runner coming, there will be a lot better uh, service and frequency in the downtown area. But we also wanna look at where people can connect into that service. And especially the areas in gray have transit service, but it's often at 60 minutes, which is not really enough to connect in in a sustainable way. So what can we do to help improve some of those transit connections? The last element we've looked at related to this is safety and congestion, looking at what might be impacted by special events and weekend traffic, where is that happening? What kind of detours are there? And also seeing other crashes, ones involving vehicles and all different modes, where are they happening and where are they the worst? And you can see some different uh, squares that show with the red, where we have a high number of fatal and incapacitating crashes. Um, not necessarily unexpected to see in those areas because there are a lot of people with different modes and different um, going different places. And so that's something that we're gonna focus on as part of the mobility study. So our next steps are to complete this context assessment and traffic analysis. We're working on defining a mobility vision and performance measures. We'll be developing potential project concepts and evaluate scenarios. Those scenarios may include changes to the one-way pairs, making changes to the interstate spurs, 
looking at bicycle and pedestrian facilities. We're looking at this whole range of different potential projects. We'll be using modeling to help us see the impact of them and how different ones might work in different combinations. And of course, public feedback and help with the prioritization of projects. Here's my contact information. And I do wanna let you know that we recently put up a new website. The site is the same, forwardpinellas.org slash DTSP, but we do have an interactive comment map where you can put your thoughts on the downtown St. Pete area and also see what other people are saying and like, dislike and upload photos. Um, and that's gonna help us get an idea of, again, what kind of issues or concerns people have, if there are ideas or suggestions we should be looking at. And we're gonna continually think about different ways to reach out to people. Um, as I mentioned before, we know people are interacting a little differently right now. And so we're really looking for ideas and suggestions and trying to think innovatively about how to reach people and get their feedback throughout the whole study. So thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Sarah, a very, very informative presentation. Are there questions from the committee members? Josh Frank has a hand up. Sorry, Chris. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just have a couple of quick questions. A great presentation. Um, I'm curious, are you going to be uh, doing more um, granular survey based data um, for some of the socioeconomic metrics that you showed? Um, I know they look like they were done by census tract, but um, I'm curious if uh, you're going to look at those in comparison to say some of the crash um, heat maps, which are a little bit more granular um, in scale. And so it'd be really interesting to see how those sort of overlay together if, if possible. I know it's hard to get that information from the ACS and stuff like that, but just curious. That's a great question. We are looking at the crash data in more detail, especially because we have the Safe Streets Pinellas effort going on right now, which is a Vision Zero project and we're working on developing the action plan for. We are still going to do some analysis. I'm not sure how fine grained we'll even be able to get with some of the socioeconomic data, because like you said, the data is a little hard to, to find. But we're definitely looking at um, access and livability and different measures like that. So I could definitely see some of those livability or accessibility performance measures, safety ones related to that. Thank you. Dave Goodwin has his hand raised. Dave, you're recognized. Thank you, Chairman. Sarah, uh, happy holidays to you and Brian. Um, question I have is regarding the interstate feeders. Um, are those, uh, it's been a topic of discussion as you know in St. Petersburg about potentially modifying them or eliminating them. Is that something that at this point you know or don't know will be become part of the study and further subject to further evaluation? Thank you, Dave. Uh, great question. We are looking at those. So we've already started to think about internally with the project management team, which includes um, economic development and transportation staff, as well as others, um, what potential scenarios for the interstate spurs might be. So if we were to, for example, roll them back, if we were to eliminate them completely. And we're also thinking about uh, if there are other scenarios like a boulevard, or if we wanted to go um, uh, make changes to the access without touching the interstate spurs, maybe going over or under. We're still evaluating some of those to see the impact, but those are definitely on the table and things that we're considering. And we've heard, interestingly enough, uh, maybe not a surprise to you, but that there are a lot of people interested in both 175 and 375 because they see them as barriers. Um, I know a lot of, there's been a lot of discussion about 175 because of the Tropicana field site but we've heard a lot about 375 as well. And so we're looking at what happens, especially when we start to model them and understand the travel patterns better. What happens if we make changes to one or both and how they look. We are in the process of getting a set of data that helps us understand where people are coming from and how they travel there beyond just the survey results. So we'll be able to tell based on aggregated Bluetooth data where people are coming from and how they're accessing downtown and where they're going. So for example, if you're coming from the north, are you getting off at 375 or 175? Does that depend on where you're going? Does that change if you're coming from say Pasco County or if you're coming from Manatee County, Hillsborough or another part of Pinellas? So we are looking at a bunch of different ways to help us understand uh, 
impacts to those spurs. Great, thank you, sir. One, one quick kind of technical question. There was a slide that mentioned um, a percentage of folks that were 100% below the poverty level. Yes. I wasn't sure what that meant. Uh, that is based on American Community Survey data, which looks at the poverty level in a certain area. There's a threshold that's set by the federal government. And so if that threshold is exceeded to a certain amount, they could show up in that map. It, it means there's a higher concentration of people who are um, you know, poor or um, okay. aren't getting yeah. an income. It's income-based. I did understand that. It was the 100% below... Ah, that's you know, a threshold living. from the federal government. Got it. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Dave. Other questions? Chris, any other hands? I do not see any. All right. Well, Sarah, thank you very much. I mean, this is very interesting information. We're a regional organization, but a region is made up of uh, multiple local areas. And so we hope you'll come back and give us a, an update uh, as this study proceeds. I will. Thank you so much for having me and happy holidays. Thank you very much. Same to you. All right, committee members. Uh, the next item on our agenda is the uh, TD Tampa Bay. Um, Chris, Chris, you're going to do this one? I will take this. Uh, thank you, Bill. Uh, wanted to give you an overview on a really great program we've just started at the beginning of December. TD Tampa Bay, and the TD stands for Transportation Disadvantage. This is the program that uh, TBART is doing in, in connection with USERV to provide county to county transportation to those who most need it, those who are qualify as transportation disadvantaged because of age, income, or disability. So a little overview on what the program is, and then I'm going to show you some of the things we're doing to, to begin the outreach. As I mentioned, the program really has only been in operation for the last two weeks, but we're trying to spread the word on it. And that's one reason why I wanted to bring it to your attention here today. It is a partnership of TBARTA and USERV. USERV is a well-established organization that helps provide mobility to those who need it, such as those uh, because of disability who need extra transportation. Uh, they did the Advantage Ride program. Uh, they are the ones who actually schedule the drivers uh, and uh, have a phone bank to uh, organize the rides as well. Uh, the funding for this program is provided by a grant from the Florida Commission for Transportation Disadvantaged. It's a innovation and service development grant. So it is money that does not take away from any of the local CTCs that are providing that in-county transportation. And that's my third bullet point there. We are coordinating with the local counties. Every county in the state of Florida has a CTC, a community transportation coordinator that provides transportation disadvantaged transportation within its own counties. But there's long been seen a gap in getting from one county to another. Um, and uh, the counties do a great job of providing TD transportation within the county. But what if you're in Pinellas and would need to go to Moffitt? Or if you get a job in Hillsborough County and you, you know, uh, live in Pinellas County, uh, what kind of service can be provided to help you that way? That's what this service is designed to do. It's designed to work in coordination with the local CTCs to add on additional county to county transportation. So our primary service is that county to county transit. And the secondary service is to offer some off hours transportation in county where applicable. So to give you an example, I think Sunshine Line, which is the provider of TD service in Hillsborough County operates uh, until five o'clock on weekdays. Uh, we operate until 10 o'clock on weekdays. So if someone needs an in-county ride uh, in Hillsborough County, TD Tampa Bay is available to provide that. Uh, during regular business hours, if a person needs a ride within Hillsborough County, Sunshine Line is always the primary service provider. So we are, we are working with the CTCs to add on in addition to their service. We're not taking any service away from those CTCs. Uh, many of you are aware of what transportation disadvantaged is, but there uh, is a uh, definition of it defined by Florida statutes. I won't read this, but essentially what it is, is an individual who has to qualify due to disability, income status, or age, and not having uh, other transportation available to them, they can qualify for some of these services that are provided in county, and of course now provided county to county by TD Tampa Bay. I wanna give you a quick overview of how the program runs. Uh, we require that people qualify just as they have to do with their local CTCs. You can't call up and say, yeah, I'm, I, I, uh, 
I'm income disadvantaged and can you give me a ride? You have to demonstrate that with proof with the local CTCs. You have to apply with TD Tampa Bay as well. We apply the same criteria as the local CTCs do. So we're in sync with them. Uh, this is a little closer look at the application that you can find online on our website. Uh, you may be able to see there on the uh, left-hand side, the, the larger page that's obscured there a little bit. Uh, our application starts by letting individuals know what their local CTC provider is. And so each of the five counties that we serve, we want to make sure they know if you need in-county transportation, uh, you should already be signed up and uh, eligible with your own CTC. And if you're not, here's how you contact them. And then we have our own form on top of that, which has uh, really the same criteria that a lot of the CTCs use. There are some variations from county to county, but we are following the state guidelines as to what qualifies somebody. And you have to demonstrate a, a, you know, a lack of income or a disability uh, or, or one of the age criteria that we have. And of course, not having access to transportation. We've done some marketing outreach for this. Uh, the uh, program was really proposed late summer and we had a couple of rounds in which we went to the state organization to get it approved. It's finally finalized in late October. And with that, we started doing some marketing to spread the word. Uh, we had a November news release. We've been on WFLA AM radio. Um, but really most of our marketing is going to come in reaching out to the transportation disadvantaged population and directing them to our website, tdtampabay.com. It is also a page on our website that directs you actually to tbarda.com. And you can find this page under our planning and programs tab. And uh, here you've taken a, a close look at what the, uh, the first page was. Uh, it's since been updated because that says service begins on December 1st. Well, service has certainly begun. But we direct people to the website because uh, there's uh, not only information on the program, but also an application for people to provide. We also provide a lot of uh, marketing materials for the CTCs, and we've been reaching out to disability advocates. Uh, I'll talk about those in a little bit, but just one more page on our website right here. One of the things you will find are questions and answers. What is TD Tampa Bay? What does it mean to be transportation disadvantaged? What are our hours? So we have a, a, a nice frequently asked questions page, and we've been getting a lot of questions, by the way, as we've been reaching out and how this service works. We put a lot of that on our website as well. You'll also see that on our page, we have individual sub pages for each county in uh, which we uh, give a little synopsis of the local CTC provider. This is an example of uh, Hernando counties, which is Trans Hernando provided by Mid Florida Community Services. So depending upon the county that you reside in, you can click on that county and it will give you information on your local CTC. It will uh, give you information on uh, the hours that TD Tampa Bay rides for county to county service. And then you can't see it on this page here, but if you page down, you'll see at the bottom it says TD Tampa Bay in-county service. Those are the hours that we provide uh, uh, in-county service uh, when the local CTCs may not be operating. Uh, and it varies from county to county. So uh, right now we're providing extra service uh, in three counties, that being Hillsborough, Pasco, and, and Hernando County. And this is a look at the flyer that we've produced. We've uh, individualized this to each of the counties. But once again, this is the flyer that's designed for Hernando County. And uh, we've had great uh, success in working with our CTCs because they're distributing this flyer on their rides, on their TD rides, or in the case of reaching out to Hart and uh, PSTA, we're asking them to distribute it to their paratransit riders. Uh, and so we've been getting a great response from some of this, but they're working with us hand in hand to try to, to spread the word on this because of course we're providing service that they're not able to, uh, that they've been getting some calls for. So now there's a new service to do that. So uh, this flyer and information is available on our website. I would tell you that if any of you feel that you know of an organization that would like some information on this, happy to distribute flyers to you as well. Of course, we're reaching out to the disability community, but you know, a lot of people know things and word of mouth. So as you say, hey, uh, I think this organization you know, represents individuals with disabilities and I wanna make sure they know about this or we know some people who are trying to find jobs who may be transportation disadvantaged. Um, happy to make that available either electronically or in print. We've also been reaching out with emails and newsletter. And this is just a quick little uh, look at some of the newsletter mentions as we reach out. Of course, everybody uh, you know, connects electronically or on social media. So we've been getting great support from the counties. Uh, and this is just a two paragraphs of what TD Tampa Bay is. And of course, we're directing folks to um, go to the website to learn more. There is a call center, which is where you call to schedule rides. But first and foremost, we want you to go to the website, get an application. You can certainly call us and we'll be happy to answer more questions there. And as I wrap up here and open up for questions, uh, this is the team. Uh, Christy Anuntis, who's also on the call here today, is our project manager. 
I'm handling the outreach as director of communications and uh, Steve Holmes, who works with user, the company we've uh, partnered with uh, to provide this actual service. There's his uh, contact information there. So uh, with that, a little overview on what we're providing. I will tell you, we're very excited about it because TBAR does a lot of planning on very big projects that take a long time, as you know, to, to, to get going. You know, the BRT project is significant, but it, it's years away. This is service that's happening right now, and it's happening for a segment of the population that I think can really benefit from transit and transportation. So we're, we're very excited to be actually providing this. In addition to our commuter services division, this is something that we're, we're providing right now to people to help them get to where they want to go regionally. And so it really speaks to the T-BART mission. And uh, very excited about it. And uh, I look forward to your support and suggestions. Thank you, Chris. Uh, that is a really significant project. I'm glad to see T. Barta taking the lead and coordinating between the counties. Uh, Bob Whitmer has a question. Oh, still muted, muted Bob. Bob. Oh, not there so much go. a comment, but uh, a question, but a comment. And Chris is right. Uh, Hernando was very excited about this because their service plan specifically called for intercounty. Uh, uh, connection. And as uh, we told Brian Pizarro what that was, uh, I, I think that's how the whole thing worked. You met with the people in Hernando County, and I think Joe DeGeorge is probably your main contact. I haven't talked to him recently, but uh, they were very excited about this, and uh, hopefully uh, it is working out as well as you described. It's, it's early going. Uh, we've gotten a few rides. Uh, as we spread the word, we see it starting to grow. Um, but what we see, interestingly enough, is uh, people are using it for employment, which we really find exciting. Um, we, we, I would say, even though we've probably got less than 20 rides for the first couple of weeks, which is understandable because we're just getting going, about half of those are people who, are, who need it to go to jobs. And uh, mm -hmm. those not only are recurring rides, but I, I help, you know, empowering people to be employed. It's just so important. So we're really happy about that. It's great for the TD community. Thank you. I see Karen has her hand raised as well. Karen, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you both, Chris, is for putting this together. I'm really excited that um, our TD riders are going to get across the bay and across the other county lines, which was something that for years frustrated a lot of people. My question is about the redundancy or is there redundancy in the application method? I know PSDA has their own application, HART has their own application. Is there a way we can consolidate this so that there's one stop? We've asked but to do that actually. Our preference would be that anybody who is qualified at the county level is automatically qualified with us but the counties have different criteria and because they have a reporting structure to the CTC, we've gotten different feedback from different counties and some counties are not as comfortable with that. And in working with the state, the state actually as part of this grant said, we want you to qualify individuals yourself. So given that this is their innovative grant program and we had some uh, difference of opinion among the counties uh, because they op all operate a little bit differently. Yes, to your point, absolutely. The easiest thing would be to get a list of everybody who's TD eligible. Um, but right now, uh, just based on a couple of factors, we're doing our own application process. Well, when does the grant expire, Chris? It's a pilot project. So because we kind of hit this up in the middle of the project year, it's going to go through June at this point. But we really envision it being, you know, multi years up to three years. Uh, eventually, you know, if this is continual. Uh, we, we work with Userve, uh, which provides the actual riders and drivers, but there's, there's thinking long term beyond the first two, three years that T-BARTA would actually take over the service of this. So uh, right now, we, our grant will get us through June 30th. We are measuring uh, uh, what the rides are. We're working with Cutter. Uh, Cutter is actually going to conduct the study. And so what we do is we plan to go back to CTC in the spring and say, hey, here's granular information about how people used our service, what the response was. And we're optimistic that if we show enough interest, uh, that the program will be uh, continued beyond next June. I hope so too. Thank you both, Chris. Appreciate it. Thank you. I think Josh raised his hand. Yeah, just to sort of follow up on that, um, you know, I'm wondering, uh, 
what is there any way for us to make that that form and that application uh, available online as well as maybe a, a way to make it a little bit easier for for some of our TV folks? Well, it is online. It is online, and you can fill it out electronically. You'd have to uh, re reply with some proof of you know what your disability is or age, and if you can scan in or you have that. We actually have, um, I haven't seen it yet, but we had our, one of our project meetings this morning and someone said there's a Google Forms link that would allow you to automatically reply right with that Google's form. Um, I, I hear that's in development, I haven't seen that yet, but we might add that onto our site. So it is online, you can print it. Some people like to print and mail it as you probably saw the address down there. Ideally, we'd rather have you save it electronically and just submit it via email, but we're, we're looking at all of that. And then just as a quick second piece to that is I know, um, just from experience, there's a lot of conversations about making uh, websites ADA accessible in terms of um, everything down to font size and um, color palettes for, for those folks who may be colorblind, that sort of thing. So I'm just making sure that if we do offer this as a transportation disadvantage, that that's also part of the concept as well. No, and I appreciate that. In section 508 requirements on that, which is what you're referring to, interestingly, my, my position prior to this, um, I oversaw a, a, a nonprofit called Enable America, which helped individuals with disabilities, most notably in the military sector, find employment. And through that, I worked with a, a gentleman who was blind, Richard Sale, in downtown attorney. And so Richard was very big on this, and this is part of what the service was we offered. So I, have, I bring a little bit of understanding about that. When we redid, redid our website, accessibility, making sure that we make the WCAG, you know, I think it was 2.0 requirements that time. That was all factored into what we did in terms of contrast and, and making sure you've got alternate tagged images, all of that. So I appreciate you bringing that up. Good. Any other hands, Chris? I do not see any. Chris, Chris maybe, maybe I missed it in your presentation, but did, with this program, either currently or in the future, provide transportation across all of the counties of the T-Barta service area, or is it just from one county to an adjoining county? It's, it's to any county in the T-Barta service area of our five counties. So if you're in Hernando and you want to schedule a trip to Manatee, we can yeah. provide that. If you're in Hernando and want to go to Citrus because you're outside the T-Barta zone, we don't currently offer that. That's outside what the grant can do. So, okay. you know, it, understandably, there are some people in Manatee who may want to go to Sarasota or vice versa, we can't do that now, but anywhere within our, our five county region, we provide that cross county transportation. Great. I, I think that's, I think that's huge, uh, potentially long term, especially for our region. Um, and is this, is this information being uh, provided to all of the MPOs so they can uh, help promote the program? Absolutely. In fact, at four o'clock, we've got a, a call with the MPO coordinator for Hillsboro um, this afternoon. So that's coming up. But yeah, we have been directly working with um, all of those boards and, and reaching out to them as well. Good. Thank you. Yeah, yeah Bill, this is Chris, Chris, the other Chris, if I can add. Um, those Please. trips, uh, the copay for each trip is $6. So I think that's very reasonable um, for a cross-county trip, especially if you're going across a couple counties. Um, and to answer the question, uh, we the other question, we've been uh, making presentations to the local coordinating boards um, for the transportation disadvantage. So they're aware and uh, hopefully they're gonna help us get the word out as well. Good, great, that, that, that's a bargain at $6. Uh, so thank you for putting this together. Hope the, hope the grant is renewed and becomes a permanent or semi-permanent operation of Tibarla. Karen, did you have another comment or were you just raising your hand? <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I don't know if this is if this will affect it, but what if about uh, evacuations? Has that been discussed? I've had no considerations about that. Um, I don't know, Chris, if that's come up in your conversation with Steve at all. Not at all, but that could be a conversation for uh, our five our Friday nine o'clock meeting. Good, good point. Good question, Karen. Okay, any further questions or comments? I think this was a very informative presentation, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, committee members, we'll move to the next uh, portion of our agenda. And you'll recall that um, at a previous meeting, we talked about having a general discussion or a workshop work session on, uh, on our committee. And uh, 
what we see as our mission, how we might be able to uh, be more helpful and productive and be of assistance to the T-BARTA board. Um, you know, we're just for, for some of our members, I think most of you know, we meet every two months. We're, we have representatives from all of the counties um, and each of the counties in the T-BARTA service area have uh, unique and different requirements. Uh, but our mission is to address those requirements from a regional perspective. So uh, I threw out uh, on your agenda uh, several sample questions. I don't propose that we try to address each and every one of them individually, but I hope uh, hopefully that would provide some food for thought. So um, if anyone would like to, uh, to start by addressing those questions, uh, the, the first one is simply, well, how do you perceive your role as a member of the CAC and, uh, and how might you be more effective and more productive in support to the TVARTA board? Comments from the members. Bill Johnson, have your hands up. Thank you. Um, I think the, the thing that we can do is we can be the link to the community on two things. One, the purpose of our projects and uh, also on how that the projects will be locally funded. I think we frequently ignore the local match and it's, uh, it, it takes forever to get something done. Uh, the other side of the purpose side is the purpose of providing a writer perspective, people that are uh, out there that aren't into the normal transportation world. So that's my response on that question. Bill, what, tell me more about what you mean by writer response. The writer perspective rather than the automobile perspective, automobile driver perspective. Um, we, we need to get out and ride these systems and, and look at them and help communicate to uh, the policymakers who are generally just uh, drivers of vehicles, so. Okay, good. Thank you. Bob Whitmer? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I look at uh, what Chris did here with the TD as a perfect example of our role. I think our, our role is to be a conduit, both to, to our communities and back from them up to T. Barta. Because when uh, Brian gave his presentation, I immediately went to the Hernando County Transportation Disadvantaged Local Coordinating Committee <laughs> and said, do you know about this? No, okay. And of course he was already uh, prepared to meet with them because they said they had gotten a phone call from, from these guys. So um, I think that's what our role is, uh, it, to be that conduit, uh, a two-way conduit, if you will, for what T. Barta is doing, not necessarily in your own community, but in other communities say, hey, are you interested in this? You know, if so, call so-and-so. From a regional perspective, the uh, MPO, the, the Hernando Citrus MPO uh, 2045 plan uh, liberally quoted MCORs, the program from FDOT, and they're standing behind uh, two of their three projects, namely the Sun Coast Connector and the Northern Turnpike Extension uh, for real work to be done. Uh, they also have in their uh, the plan a whole lot of local stuff, which uh, is not regional, but they also have bike, bike and pedestrian uh, regional work that they're doing. And they have noticed, noted that there is obviously a need for rail to come to Brooksville. That all depends on how, fa how fast, as I've told Mr. Uh, Jim, how fast rail will get to Wesley uh, Chapel because that's the same tracks. And if it goes there, then it's not very hard to get a PPP to come all the way back up to. So those are some of my comments. And of course the disabled uh, 
was a big part of regional planning for our, our, our uh, county. Thank you for allowing me to uh, say these things. Well, good. good. Thank you, Bob. Let, let me ask you this. Uh, uh, thinking about your comment on the rail to Brooksville, uh, is that a topic that, that you think this committee, as well as the T-BARTA board, should be monitoring more closely and possibly taking a more active role in? Well, as, as I think about uh, the allocation of funding, I would not put this even as a lead bullet, let alone a gold or a silver one. <laughs> but as I said, as I said, once you get to Wesley, you know, as I told Jim, don't forget, that's where it's going to come to Hernando. And then I think you'll see some concerted action on the part of Hernando officials to say, hey, we want to do this. Okay, good. Uh, Josh Frank, you have a comment? Yeah, I'm going to try and merge a couple of these questions together. Um, so one of the things I think um, in terms of our role and some of the some of the interests of mine um, in terms of Hillsborough County, but also regionally uh, that T-BARTA can do. And one of the values I think I, I bring to this board is that uh, for me and, and a lot of us um, in the urban design community and, and planning agencies and, and sort of in my profession, um, design professionals treat walking and biking as transit. And I think that's something that is severely lacking at a regional discourse. Um, we sort of talk about it in a little bit when it comes to regional trails networks at the state level sometimes. But generally, I think that that is an undervalued and under resourced component that is, if not more impactful, at least equally impactful to major transit projects like rail and um, the ferry and some of these other maybe more, uh, you know, alluring um, types of forms, forms of transit. So what I would like to see as a board is, is more conversations about how we can um, serve the region as, as, a, as a supplement or as a leader in some of either ongoing or potentially new um, projects uh, towards towards meeting some of those or even planning planning for some of those because um, again not only do i think that they're more immediate in terms of their impact on folks um, being able to walk and bike um, who may not own a car or just would prefer to do that but also um, in terms of uh, overall cost um, building miles of sidewalk and miles of bike lanes is in infinitely cheaper, um, exponent exponentially cheaper than building miles of rail or dedicated lane for some sort of fixed transit. So um, in, especially in a, in a time where we're hearing about budget shortfalls, I think that now is a, a better time maybe than any ever before where we can invest in some of those uh, low cost but high return concepts. So I would like to see us just you know, continually um, evolve the conversation at that, at that regional scale and, and make sure that we purposefully include some of those uh, modes as well. Good. Th thank you, Josh. We're, and speaking of, of regional trails and, and bike paths, um, the DOT is doing a lot of work, as I'm sure you know, in, in trying to connect several of the counties with, uh, with bike paths and trails. Um, would you think that this committee would be uh, welcoming of a presentation from DOT on, on what their bike path and, and pedestrian path might be? Or is that uh, within our, our scope of vision? I, I, I would think that that's definitely something I'd be interested in hearing about. I, I'd be interested in, in hearing about um, almost all of our member counties um, perspectives on both their bike and ped master plan. I know in for example, in Hillsborough, um, there's a lot of uh, ongoing work in terms of uh, Parks and Rec master plan, the, the mobility plan that's ongoing. St. Pete just had their mobility plan presentation. So right. uh, a larger facilitating a larger conversation about how those interact with each other, I think is something that maybe is more appropriate for T-BARTA than, than something else. So, um, you know, I'm definitely willing to entertain that, but, you know, that, that's just one example I can think of. So, yeah. but good. Okay, good, good suggestion. Other, uh, other comments or uh, reactions from the committee? 
Lynn has had her hand raised for a while, and I know Bob Henyon would also like to speak. All right, go ahead. Well, I see our role as, as being advocates for public transit. And um, the gentleman who, who made the distinction between the rider's perspective and a driver's perspective, and I think that that's where we need to be very proactive in bringing the rider's perspective, but not only just bringing the rider's perspective, but engaging the riders and um, finding ways to provide resources for potential riders such that riding becomes attractive and becomes part of their culture. Good. Well, I think that that uh, certainly adds a lot to, uh, to Bill Johnson's comments about ridership. Um, I appreciate that. Um, who else has their hands up? Uh, Bob Henyon and then Bob, Karen Schwartz. Bob Henyon, go ahead. That's a very good point there. <clears throat> I think we have to keep mindful. <clears throat> Sorry, my voice is off a little today. <clears throat> uh, of the idea that transit is part of our new name. And we really have to keep focused on that. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me, could you go to the other person and come back to me, please? Sure, of course, Bob. We go ahead. Um, who was that? Karen Mullis? Karen Schwartz. Karen Schwartz, excuse me. Karen, uh, go ahead. Uh, man, it, it, there was just a loud clap of thunder here, which is, I wasn't expecting. Um, actually, I want to uh, also address the transit issue. Who, who's the fellow who came here from Denver? Is he, are you still on the. That would be. Um... And that is uh, Ken Bowden, who I think is listening. And uh, yeah, <laughs> Ken, I'm promoting you to panelists, so I think you can speak. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so actually, Ken, Ken I, um, I came here from Boulder and was shocked at how disappointing the public transit was. And I lived in, I lived in Den the Denver area for over 30 years and saw how it blossomed into a place where public transit was easy and fast, reliable, you know, going from no way to get to Denver from Boulder, except with a car, to now you get on a very fast bus. Um, I, I, what is your thoughts coming from Denver and being involved in transportation? I wasn't, I, I really was not involved at all, and I didn't pay much attention, except I got very excited when I could take a bus really fast into downtown Denver. Um, what is your, um, I don't know, how do you read the tea leaves here in um, the St. Pete, uh, I mean, in the Tampa Bay area, in terms of getting to the type of transit that, that we really need, and that would be similar to the kind of transit that we eventually had in the Denver metro area? Yeah, thank you for uh, letting me share. And I apologize for all the boxes in the background. Um, but what I would say is that um, I think what I see uh, T. Barta is on the right track and that's uh, trying to build out a BTR system, um, a BRT system rather, where that is the focus of uh, T. Barta to flesh out that regional connectivity. Um, and one thing that I would say in comparison to RTD, um, which is the Regional uh, Transportation District, Rapid Transit District for uh, Denver and the Denver Metro area is that it has had a tendency over time to become quite ossified and not providing that good local connectivity that, um, different centers really could use in the Denver metro area. I think RTD is fantastic, like you said, connecting Boulder with Denver. Um, however, if you um, live outside of that core area, um, you live outside of the Denver downtown area, RTD has had a difficulty with connecting folks to other centers, other regions in the area. 
And um, what I particularly like about Heart PSTA um, is that it really it really does provide a good foundation for that local connectivity. And I think just adding Tbarta into that with regional connectivity is really a smart move. It's really a way to go. I I think the positive I think the future looks really positive for the the region. Well, I'm I'm looking forward to the day when I can hop on a really fast bus and get to the airport in a half an hour. You know? Absolutely. I agree. That's one of the great services of RTD. I, I totally agree. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I want to see it here. Anyway, <laughs> well, nice meeting you. <laughs> nice to meet you too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Someone was trying to to be heard and it was a bit muffled. He said it doesn't tell you like that, psychologically. Richard, I don't know if Richard Balcom's in the meeting. Uh, I don't know if Richard, you wanted to recognize yes, I, Dave Goodwin has his hand raised as well. Yes, I did. Uh, I just want to speak as an alternate um, with your first question, how do you perceive your role in the t or c and c um, I've served as both the regular member and I'm serving as an alternate. And right now I perceive my role is to to, to be a voice and, and, and listen, uh, you know, for the Pasco citizens and also for all the presentations that I listen to here on Zoom and uh, in all the committees that are being formed and all the presentations and have that communication with the regular board member and also with the community. But I also support all the other comments that were made as well. Uh, that I think if I was the regular committee member, uh, I would also encourage a lot of what was already spoken about, Look, and especially emphasizing what you know is going on in your community to share with other communities because this is a regional plan. Okay, thank you, Richard. We, we appreciate you taking the time to join us uh, as an alternate. <laughs> All right, thank you, uh, Bill. So picking up on those comments, what, what's the feeling of the committee about um, adding to our agenda, maybe on each meeting or every other meeting, an opportunity for the committee members to simply talk about what they're hearing in their local counties? I mean, each of us, each of us has been appointed to this committee from uh, either a T-Bar a board member or some other source, and our one of the things that we are, I think, are supposed to be doing is to getting be getting feedback into the process for the T-Bar to board of what we hear. Um, it, is that is that something you'd like to see added to our agenda in order to further that mission? Josh, you want to comment? Uh, absolutely, I think that's something that I would absolutely like to see. Um, you know, I, I wanted to add to that, and I'm I'm maybe a relative newbie on the board still. Um, and maybe this is just, you know, typical, but um, I, I still feel as a, as a CSC member that I haven't personally, or as a, as a group here, we haven't really had much engagement at all with the board. Um, and, you know, I, I typically, I've been on other boards where, you know, it, it is infrequent, but it does happen where you maybe get some feedback and at least interact to some extent um, within Sunshine with the board um, that says at least an introduction, you know, here's some things that we're thinking about, here's some things that we've talked about um, and through no fault of anybody's, but I think this, uh, the Zoom platform also amplifies that feeling of sort of speaking into the void a bit. So um, that's just sort of my, my two senses that I, I enjoy these meetings. I like talking to all of you. I like seeing these presentations and uh, I like giving, giving feedback, but I, I really don't have a clear sense of if my feedback's ever being heard and um, to what impact I'm actually having. So that's not to, not to give you an existential crisis or anything like that, but that's just uh, something that's top of mind. I, I, see, uh, I see Karen smiling. Richard, go ahead, then I'll come in. Yeah, I did, I did want to comment on just what was said by Josh. Uh, 
you know, having been involved in this committee for a very long period of time, and I know that the bill is, it has been as well, I think it would be important for us to have some discussion to consider that the chair of this committee is actually sits on the board and has a vote. I know that maybe Bill can maybe comment, uh, you know, what his experience has been and, and, and others. But when you do go to the board meeting, uh, you do bring a lot of information about the CAC, but would it be more valuable uh, for our input and our discussions to have really the person that's the chair of this committee actually be a board member and be voting? That's certainly an interesting, interesting proposal. Um, <clears throat> too bad Ron Pierce has left the call. Um, I know it's a legislative issue. Yeah. Uh, I would think so, yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, I don't think that would be allowed under the, under the structures. Um, yeah. Getting well, back to, I think we should have that too. And it should be at every meeting so that there's an open-ended point where any member of this committee can bring up what's important to them or what's important to their constituency. I do want to get back to that one point that I, my voice let me down on. And that was Bob Widmar had commented on uh, transit connections up to Hernando County. And I think we have to be very mindful of our outlying counties. We've already seen threats from, Whit, uh, from Manatee County that they might consider leaving here. And our staff went down there very dutifully and got, gave them real attention as to what their problems were. So I think that paying attention to each of the counties within the region is extremely important. Uh, that's off the track of the current topic, but. No, I think that I, I think that's exactly on topic, Bob, because I think that that's why we have members on this committee from every county as well. And uh, so we, we want to not just welcome those comments, but encourage them. Um, Bill Johnson, I know you had your hands up a moment ago where you wanted to make a comment or just supporting a motion or a, a comment. I was supporting your suggestion. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Lynn also has her hand raised. Lynn, go ahead. Um, as, as a representative for Hernando County, um, I, I do not believe that this county can grow and be healthy without public transportation. Um, and, and I have brought this forth to our leaders over and over and over again. Um, we have no guarantee as to what the price of gas is going to be at any given point in time. It is absolutely impossible to live here in Hernando County, make $30,000 a year and work down in Tampa if there is not public transportation to facilitate getting to and from that job such that you're making a livable wage. And um, so that's where part of my advocacy comes from. And, um, and that's my two cents. Okay, good. That's exactly what we want to hear. Other hands up, Chris? I do not see any at this time. I see uh, Bob Whitmer. Bob Whitmer and then Rick Richmond. Bob, go ahead. Uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, go along with a couple of people here who have said things about the only thing I'm disappointed with with our, our committee, or not our committee, T. Barta, is uh, we talk about rail all the time. And I understand it's expensive. But every city I've lived in, worked in, whether it's here in the United States or overseas, has, for all practical purposes, including Cleveland, where I was born, a viable rail system, a commuter rail system, that gets you from places like Hernando County into the city for sports, for Dr. Tampa General is the only place now you can get COVID. Of course, we can't, but you know what I mean. And I, I, I have to say I'm disappointed. I understand legislatures move slowly. I understand funding moves slowly. But, you know, there, there really is not a groundswell of people pushing to either get these CSX lines and change them or do something to get rail 
as a viable option for Tampa. And I seem to remember one partnership presentation where they said that Tampa was not considered a good place to relocate a business because it did not have a viable rail system. So I'll just, uh, and, and that's the end of my rant. Thank you, Bill, for allowing me. And uh, uh, Karen, I, I got a boy in, uh, in Boulder and we use 36 uh, up and down, you know, to get to the city. And uh, yeah, your comments are dead on and Lynn, yours too. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Bob. Rick, Rick Richmond, did you want to comment? I can't hear Rick, even though he's unmuted. Hey, Rick, I don't know if you can hear us. I see you're unmuted, but we don't hear you for some reason. Your microphone may not be working. I see your lips moving, but nothing's coming through, unfortunately. We could go to Karen now if you'd like to, yeah. uh, Bill. Let's do that. Karen, go ahead and we'll come back to Rick. Yeah, I had actually asked for a presentation on rail um, uh, when we had a representative. I don't I don't know if Rick is a representative from the camp, camp um, Patricia Kemp's um, representative representation on this board. Um, I'd like to see it, I'd like to hear it, and I'd also like to get an update on Brightline because apparently it's coming up to Orlando really quickly. And I'd also like to get a background on who exactly owns Brightline because I heard that Vir uh, Virgin had pulled out. So just getting an update on that would be great. Thanks. Okay. Let's, let's make a note uh, to ask the staff if we can get an, an update on both those projects. Uh, and yes, Virgin has um, disassociated with the Brightline project here in Florida. And, and you may, I'm sure most of the members on this committee have taken note of the fact that Brightline and Disney have recently announced an agreement for a station to serve the Disney complex, which is good for Tampa. So. Uh, Rick Richmond, you want to try again? Can you hear me now? There, that, yeah. maybe that's better. Much there better. You thank you. Great, thank you. All, all great points, and I agree. It's great conversation. One, one other little layer is, you know, or I want to expand upon. We're all appointed by certain um, entities or individuals, uh, and I think, um, you know, the those who are appointed by the MPO CACs. You know, we use on on our committee. I I have a an agenda item on our CAC MPO meeting where I'll actually update what we've been talking about, some of the topics, so that those on the Hillsborough County MPO CAC are educated and informed of what the discussion is go. You know, what discussion is going on, what kind of topics and the activities of TBARDA. So I think that's important. Um, as well as an engagement with, with the uh, MPO board. So just another, another wrinkle there. Appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Uh, that's a good point, Rick. And let me ask those who are appointed from the, uh, from the MPOs. I mean, we, we fought for a number of years to get uh, voting representation for those members representing the MPOs. Uh, would you find it valuable to, to give this committee feedback from what's happening at your MPOs? Anybody care to comment on that idea? I was going to say uh, Bill Johnson would probably be the person from Pinellas County. I'm currently the chair of the CAC over at MPO, but I'm we're having a, a uh, an election and I'm termed out. But Bill Johnson from from I know he's appointed by another person, but he's very active and very knowledgeable. So Bill, how do you feel about that for Pinellas? <laughs> Um, we have so much um, that is uh, on our plate that I just wonder if uh, having a standing update would uh, take uh, too much time rather than having it be uh, a uh, discussion as needed, uh, sharing information from the individual MPO groups. My, my reaction, I think the, what Bill and what Lynn have talked about is representing users of transit is a, uh, a huge opportunity for us. Yeah. 
I think that's I think that's a fair point, Bill, and and possibly we can have an agenda item, if not every month, maybe every other month, where those who have something to report of significance that would be of regional interest could bring that to the committee uh, here. So I'd certainly welcome that, and I think Rick Richmond made a good point. Um, any other hands up? Any other comments or suggestions? Karen Mullins. Karen. Yeah, I just wanted to, to say some of the, the kind of banter that was going on at our MPO was um, possibly not approving the TIP amendments for, <laughs> for uh, road service to try to get that money allocated for transit rather than putting more cement on our roads. Yeah, good, good point. And, and Rick Richmond knows that we have that uh, debate uh, yeah. at the Hillsborough MPO CAC every year. So, yes, we uh, do. So, so Richard Balcom would like Richard, to have a Yes, go ahead, Richard. I'm gonna unmute you. Richard, you're recognized to be unmuted. Turn your mute off. Can you hear me? Yes. Now we can, yes. Okay, uh, thank you, Bill. I wanted to speak a little bit and, and get some some discussion and, uh, and feedback from all the members here in terms of our meeting strategy. Um, you know, I believe that the efficiency and innovation going forward and how we meet and how much we can get done by our meetings, we probably have learned a lot uh, from COVID-19 uh, that there are ways that you can efficiently meet example, Zoom. Um, we have legislative issues, I realize, of what can be considered a forum, what you can vote on, what you can't vote on. As I understand that currently we meet six times a year every other month. And I'm wondering if it makes sense for us to have maybe some discussion to reconsider that in light of that we have ways that we can communicate that are much more efficient than driving somewhere, being on the road, in a car, one person, taking up and filling up traffic to go say from Pasco to Pinellas or Hillsborough or Hillsborough to Hernando and so forth, that we use this virtual uh, capabilities that are available to us today that were not available years ago, that people are beginning to have a feeling that meeting in person is beginning to fall out of favor a little bit, that maybe we have three or four virtual meetings and we have two meetings a year, maybe April and October as an example, that you do meet face-to-face -face and you can, you can rotate those over the course of a couple of years and three years and so forth. You know, it's either Hernando and then you move it to Hernando with, or, or Pinellas or Pasco and so forth. But that we think about that as a way to maybe get more done because I know being involved with this since the beginning, attendance has always been a problem. Having decisions made have been slow because of voting, because of the forms. And you know, if we can be a little more efficient and a little more innovative going forward and use these new tools that are available to us today like Zoom, and there'll be others, I'm sure, as we move forward, that, that that's a better way for us to begin to think about, you know, the decisions we can make on the subjects that we have to be addressed with. Well, I think that I think that's a really interesting uh, suggestion and comment, Richard. And I think um, it, it might very well be that we could uh, structure our meetings so that we could meet more frequently and not have to meet in person. Those are those are issues that are going to be decided uh, based on what what we have to take, what action we have to take at a particular meeting, and whether or not we're able to solve this quorum issue that Ron Pierce addressed, which would allow us to have hybrid meetings where some members are there in person, some members are there virtually. Um, but in order to take any action we do have to have a quorum. So let's take that one under advisement. I like the idea personally. Um, I think I raised in our last meeting the possibility of this committee meeting more frequently and that might be a, a possible solution to try out for next year or sometime in the future. 
Any other hands up, uh, Chris? We have uh, three hands. You have Karen Schwartz, Karen Mullins, and Bob Henyon. So Karen Schwartz would be first. Karen Schwartz, go ahead. Well, I want to say, Richard, that you read my mind. And what really troubles me, actually, is that here we are discussing public transit, yet we're all driving to those meetings because so far it's only been talk. Um, I don't know what it's going to take to change the, the rule about quorums being in person. I, I don't really understand it at all. I don't where how it started. May, it probably started way before we had the current tools that we do have now, when you couldn't really tell if that person on the phone line was who they said who they uh, uh, claimed to be, you know, and you didn't want that person voting because you weren't sure who they were. Um, is this something that needs to be legislated to um, uh, to allow for hybrid meetings? I know that in the early COVID days when DeSantis was actually doing something, um, he, he said, he, I guess he said it was okay to have these hybrid meetings. But now that all the restrictions have been lifted, we're back to, you gotta have a quorum in person. So I, I don't really, I, uh, I'm clueless about that. To me, it just seems ridiculous that, um, that we're expected to meet in person. And that's all um, I say. I'm sure the staff can comment on it, but I, Chris, let me take a stab at saying that, that that's part of what Ron Pierce was talking about, I think. And in the case yeah. of Hillsborough, in the case of Hillsborough County, uh, CAC, we are having hybrid meetings where we uh, are able to encourage or coax enough members to come together in person to have a quorum. And the other uh, members who choose not to come in person are able to join us virtually. And so that seems to be permissible, at least in that in that jurisdiction. Chris, go ahead. I'm sorry. I would defer to Ron Pierce and to Alan Zimmett, our counsel on that. Uh, just to Karen's earlier question, the governor issued emergency orders earlier this yeah. year that allowed for entities, city councils, commissions to meet electronically. And then those were lifted. And as of November, uh, I believe we have to meet physically in order to take action, to take official action. Right. And of course, the issue then becomes, okay, if you meet physically, if you have a hybrid meeting, what counts toward that quorum and whether you can take some action. So I would suggest uh, certainly we can take it under advisement, but um, it would, my understanding is it's going to take legislative action. Um, and some of the things Ron had referred to earlier about us being regional and even regardless of COVID, we certainly have uh, regional concerns that make it difficult for people to go from one county to another. I'd refer to Ron and then of course we, we follow the advice of counsel and Alan Zimmett and what is legally required under state statute for us to conduct these meetings. I think that's a great answer. And I think, uh, I think you're getting a sense, at least of some members of this committee, we'd like to be apprised of any effort that can move us in that direction. Ron um, is leading the charge on that, I would tell you that. Okay. You have uh, Karen Mullins and Bob Henyon. Yeah, like Karen, Karen Mullins, go ahead. I just wanna piggyback on that for a moment. Um, I did make a request to, because our uh, MPO CAC could not discuss anything if we were on the phone. And I had, I personally had taken it to our um, county commission day before yet, yesterday, it was yesterday. Um, I think we are not the only, uh, at the TMA meeting it was discussed that we are not the only um, organization that's having issues with this. So yes, I would like to see Tabarda at least um, send a memorandum to the legislature, however we communicate to, um, to ask for this hybrid situation. Um, it, you know, even before COVID we were having difficulty getting quorums. So I would like to see that push forward. And again, there was another, um, trying to get uh, uh, for Bill Roberts to, for the chair to become a member of the board of Tabarda. Is there a way to get asked for that in legislation? Well, I think, uh, I, think I would like to um, put that issue 
on an agenda for a meeting where we actually can take some action and make that recommendation. I'm reluctant to bring it to the T-BARTA board, but we can certainly have an internal discussion amongst the staff as to what that might require uh, and if it's even advisable at this point. So thank you for suggesting. Well, I'd like, I'd like to just say that there is a, an end point. I think it's the beginning of February. So that'll be, that'll push it a year out just to make that comment that, that yeah. it will push this issue a year from sure. uh, March or actually, yeah, March or no, it'd be in January of next year. Okay, fair enough. And there was another hand up. Chris. Bob Hanion. Bob Hanion. Bob Hanion. Bob. I think the whole business that the state's doing totally ignores the realities of the COVID pandemic. Things are not getting better, they're worse. We have a tool which will work and has worked successfully for us. We used it in uh, the Forward Pinellas CAC. We used it here and it was allowed to expire. Or it, it, yes, it was allowed to expire. And I think that should be brought to the board we feel that should be something that they can push on because they have a voice. I don't think we sit here and be quiet about that. Okay, good. Any other comments? Josh, you have a comment? I would just second that because um, one thing to, to mention is that it's one thing for appointed boards with, with uh, like ours with the mayor and, and mayor of St. Petersburg and elected officials that need a physical quorum. But for us, you know, I don't know about you guys, but for me to drive to one of these, one of the meetings and then get back um, is half my day, if not most of my day. And as soon as this Zoom call is done, I've, I'm right at my desk still. So I'm able to continue working. So most of us, I think are citizens in that right. And so maybe there's a way that we can push for CACs uh, to, to, that that rule a little bit somehow I, I don't know but I would echo what, what Bob Henyon said in that um, okay. it's a tool it works and it's working fine and I don't see any reason why we have to move beyond it so I would just reinforce that okay good thank you any other hands up Chris I do not see any at this time all right well listen this I, I think this has been great this has been a great discussion I appreciate everybody's thoughts and uh, in preparing to come to this meeting with ideas. Uh, we are a support committee for the T-BARTA board. Um, I will make an effort to be uh, a better transmitter of information between the board and the report that I give to them and the activities that the board itself takes. Um, one of the things that I've encouraged staff to do is include uh, the availability in your packets of everything that the T-BARTA board has seen at their most recent meeting so that we can kind of stay up to speed on that. Um, Bill, can so, I mention something for a second? It's Jennifer. Please, please Jennifer. So a lot of times things are restrictive because of packet size, but sure. all of our meetings are on the website and you can at any time go to our website and click on a particular meeting and get all of the packet and presentation information. Okay. And are those meetings recorded normally? Yes, everything is um, on our YouTube channel. Yes. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. So this committee has access to not just the meetings which are recorded, but also the packets of information that uh, they supported Correct. their meeting. Good. Yes, sir. All right. So the, the next item on our agenda is items to report to the T-BARTA board. We really don't have the ability to make any motions, but I have a couple of uh, comments that I think I will make, not as motions, but as, as suggestions from this committee. One is the, the idea of finding way to, to have either a hybrid meeting or a quorum by electronic purposes. Are there any other uh, suggestions that you would like for me to take to the T-BARTA board? Uh, Bill Johnson and then Bob Hinion each have their hands raised. Bill Johnson, go ahead. Bill, oh, you have to... Bill. <clears throat> Bill, you're muted. I did that accidentally. I apologize. <laughs> yeah. uh, I do have one thing, though. When you, uh, when the board uh, takes recommendations from us, 
We need to make sure that our recommendations come before they take action on an agenda item. Um, otherwise, there's not much point in us spending time reviewing an action item to just say, well, you already took uh, action on this, but we agreed with it. Good point. Bob Henyon wants to be recognized. Uh, first, it's first. It's more of a question, and then a rant. Um, <laughs> I wanted to find out. There's a lot of confusion as to where things stand in terms of COVID vaccination priorities of who gets it. I know the state of Florida is not exactly on the same track as the federal government, but that uh, nursing homes, et cetera, will be getting high priority. I just wanted to see where our drivers and our all of our transit services out there, drivers and other people, rate in, as uh, essential workers, whether they'll be getting it early, and if not in line, should T. Barter's board push the state for that? I mean, these okay. people have been out there for nine months, exposed to everything out there and serving the public. And they certainly deserve to be at the head of the line. I'll be happy to convey that message to the board unless there is an objection from anybody on the committee. No, I just want to say that I did hear a report that the um, transit drivers and transit people were going to get it, I think, right after EMS. Okay, well, that's good. I have not heard that. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Mr. Chairman? For both. Yes. Question, uh, is the uh, is the T-Bot a regular board meeting available for us for viewing? Is it recorded and we can, yes. can we view that? Yes, all we meetings are, that, we, that we can are streamed. Certainly all the board meetings are streamed and then they're always on t -Barda. Go to YouTube, search t -Barda. You'll see all the meetings in there. There would This meeting is streamed, uh, but if we met physically, let's say we were in Pasco County as we were maybe a year ago meeting in person, that room is not configured to stream. And so we certainly don't add the expense on. But to your point, t -Barda committee and board meetings are always streamed and uh, are archived continually. If I could uh, ask you, Chris, if you could just show me the link on that, and you know, I'm trying to find it right now while you guys are uh, talking. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Good. All right. Any other points that you want to raise uh, that we might recommend to the T. Barta board without taking action? All right. Well, this has been very good. Again, I thank all of you. I thank the staff for their patience and in, in uh, letting us talk about ways in which this committee can. Uh, uh, can be more effective and can work more harmoniously. Uh, is there any new business to come before uh, the committee? Got, always got a lot to talk about. Well, hearing none, again, I thank you for joining us. I hope everyone stays safe. I hope you have a wonderful holiday this month. We will reconvene at our regular meeting in February and the meeting is adjourned. Merry Christmas, Bill. Thank you. Merry Merry Bill. Christmas, thank you, everybody. Enjoy. Happy Merry holidays, Christmas. everyone. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. Well. Bye. Bye.